I have been um, interested in clearing since early 90s when I was working with clearing at OM. And um, uh, since then, clearing has always been something uh, that has been a business opportunity for us. But not uh, before 2008, we took a strategic decision at, at Sinober. And that was to uh, establish a brand new uh, clearing system from scratch based on trading technology. The reason for that was three um, things. Two, that was obviously at the time we took the decision, and three, that was the later the explanation. The first two was, of course, that um, high-frequency firms, they, um, they really needed a second opinion on their risk. Even if they didn't believe that, uh, it was obvious that that was the case. So that was the first uh, signal we got uh, in our research and development that we have to be extremely fast in calculating risk. The second reason was that it was obvious that there was no um, uh, new cl general uh, clearing system out there. So we saw a, a, a fantastic opportunity if we could develop something that was generic enough. The third reason was, of course, that uh, two months after we took the decision, we had the 15th of September when uh, we had a problem with Lehman. And it was obvious for everybody that there was too many in the market that had not a clue about their risk in real time. We launched the system 2010. And um, we have now got uh, uh, some very, very nice customers. We have DGCX in Dubai. We have uh, BVMF in Sao Paulo. We have MarketServe in, uh, in Europe and, and uh, US. And we have LME Clear, who took the decision 2011 to establish a brand new clearing house. Uh, instead of... Uh, using my 20 minutes for a slide presentation, which I think you have seen too many of, I have been taking the, the opportunity to invite Trevor Spanner, who is the Managing Director for Element Clear, to together with me have a discussion about uh, real-time clearing in, 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 in a, from a general point of view and LME Clear, to be more specific. So please, Trevor, come up and take a seat here. Trevor, could you uh, start with uh, giving us the, um, the background, the purpose uh, with the establishment of LMA Clear? Uh, yeah, um, I joined the uh, LMA back in 2011 to spearhead the post-trade services uh, area. Uh, clearing was the first uh, point on the agenda. It was something which the board had been thinking about for some considerable time. Uh, we took a decision around uh, December, I think it was, to finally go with uh, LME Clear, but it was really kind of a long process a feasibility study stretching over 12 months or so around um, not just um, should they do it, but also could they do it. Because, you know, building a clearing house isn't easy. If it was, everybody would be doing it. Uh, and therefore, you have to sort of uh, go in with your, with your eyes open. For the LME, this is really a key uh, strategic uh, enabler. Um, you've got this background of regulatory change. You've got OTC products both uh, coming onto exchange and into clearing. You've got the reporting obligation, which is starting to cluse together the trade reporting, uh, the exchange, and the CCP-type uh, functionality in terms of delivery of uh, uh, service to, uh, to clients and the fulfillment of regular obligations. So there's a real kind of sweet spot there for us to uh, to get into. So for those of you who know the uh, LME market, although we're kind of on exchange, we have been described as being kind of OTC on exchange because of the way the prompt date structure uh, works. We thought that if we could deliver a generic clearing functionality which services the LME market primarily, then obviously we could then extend the product uh, forward uh, over time. So it was all around building uh, competence, by building clearing competence. Um, although we talked about here technology, it really is a new business startup. 
with the, the full, uh, you know, kind of launch that you need to get into, the hiring the people, getting the regulatory uh, authorization, and then the delivering of the technology which, uh, which underpins it. Um, I, I've said on more than one occasion, this was all about the LME, uh, not about the LCH, who are existing uh, supplier uh, in this market. It really was a strategic decision that the board felt it, uh, it had to take to, uh, to secure itself. And I think we were kind of validated in that because no sooner had we made the announcement then we had a kind of bid process which uh, was launched for the LME and I'm sure we'll come onto that uh, in a while. Thanks. Um, from start, um, there, there must be, uh, have been uh, several important decisions to take. I'm interested both on the business side and of the, um, and on the technology side of course. I have to say that um, the process to um, choose the, uh, choose the uh, um, technology provider was one of the most profound that we have been involved in. Uh, you told me at, uh, in and it's time that you had spoken to more than 20 different uh, potential suppliers. Um, I'm, I'm personally a bit curious if, if that's, that's the right thing to do. Is that um, not too much information to take care of? Is it possible to evaluate uh, uh, such information? So I have two questions. Why so many and was it a good or bad decision? Uh, well, from the from the get-go, we had took an early uh, view that there wouldn't be an off-the-shelf, ready-to-go solution in the clearing space for us. So we knew it would be a bit of a period of discovery. We also knew that um, over time, particularly given the time period we're talking in here, you got still uh, EMEA hadn't been landed. Uh, we had a number of different other regulatory uh, things like OSCO hadn't been uh, finally dropped. So we fully anticipated the need to start this program, but anticipating a period of change where we'd have to um, kind of, you know, retro-adjust for uh, technical requirements or uh, market requirements, either from clients or from regulators, as we as they become as they become known. And you know, we've just really kind of finally landed the technical standards as of kind of last week. So it gives you an idea about you know, the, the, the period over the last 12 months, uh, how much flux there's been. But um, what we did uh, initially was we uh, sent a request for information out to about 20 firms. That did two things. It uh, allowed us to identify the kind of target population. It also gave us a lot of information about what was available. We looked uh, on two bases, on a functional component basis. So do we kind of pick and, pick and mix, if you like, a number of different providers and we do the system integration? Or do we go for an end-to-end -end solution? So after a while, we managed to get that down to six um, traditional kind of, you know, request for proposal attendees, and we had a very, very kind of disciplined and very thorough approach. Then we got down to two, and then um, we did a design study, an uh, eight-week design study where we had both firms in, and there was kind of three things that we were looking for, really, during that process. One was um, kind of show us what you said you could do during the RFP process, um, secondly uh, was um, demonstration of functionality. So we gave them a couple of kind of, you know, trick exam questions. So demonstrate how you set a client up uh, within three days. Tell us how a new uh, client will be, a new um, prompt date structure will be added, a new product. And, you know, we were fully understanding that sometimes it's difficult to do on a, on a sixpence, but, you know, it didn't stop us, uh, stop us asking. And then the third area really, which is the key one, I think, uh, for this project, uh, against this kind of business and economic background was can we work can we work together you know can we really um, develop a true partnership um, which kind of gets us to the right to the right place so that's the real story we were telling you that there was still 20 in the hunt until the very last point of course until we made the decision so. you heard my introdu introduction earlier and uh, when we took the decision 2008 to start uh, the clearing system development. Um, we did some uh, presentations at the existing clearing houses and uh, with some of the regulators because we thought that, that was the, the right place to, to start with. And the reaction was that it's good that there's coming out a new clearing system, but real time 
risk management. Why is that? Uh, nobody needed it was the uh, answer from the clearinghouses. And the, uh, the, the regulators, they were extremely happy uh, during the first meeting. All of them said, perfect, exactly what we need. Um, the problem was that when we called back a month later, they said to us, no, 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 um, we now understand that real-time clearing is, um, is impossible. And um, so my question to you is, now five years, almost five years later, uh, how, is, how important is the real-time uh, element of the clearing? Well, I think there's a couple of things to think about. One is, you know, the regulatory push is for CCPs to be uh, always aware. So you need to be uh, not just kind of on top of your game in terms of your individual positions, but have a kind of wider understanding of what's happening in the marketplace. And here we're not just talking about positions, we're talking about collateral, you know, the, the kind of what you're holding against the, uh, the positions from a risk perspective. And so when we talk about real-time or near-time capability, it's that um, transparency of information, so we don't know exactly where we stand, uh, either at the pre-trade credit risk checking uh, perspective or the post um, you know, novation and uh, position assumption uh, basis through to collateral revaluation. So the, um, you know, the, the prototyping we've been doing on the system enables us for a single view, which allows us to look at position against collateral almost, you know, we talk about real time, it's as near as real time to the eye as you can, as you can make it, then the ability to call that collateral. That's one of the um, things that we uh, are working through very carefully because it's not enough just to be able to have the information to hand. You don't have to do something about it. And the ability to then to be able to push the button, uh, instigate the, uh, the collateral call, get it back in the box and make sure that you've had it confirmed is, is very powerful. So what we've started to do here is to look at how we could use uh, the client GUI to present the same sort of information that we have in front of us to the client. So nobody should be surprised when we call up and we say, guess what, you're over, you're over position and we need some extra collateral because of a price, a position or another movement and we need to call collateral. They should be able to see it on the, on the screen at the same time. Perfect. To start a brand new clearinghouse uh, in Europe is not uh, uh, an every day's work. My opinion is that it's a very long time since it was done in the way you are doing it. With a new organization, with new system, new rule book, new regulator uh, as well. Um, you must have really have had your, your hands full. So, um, if you are looking back a year from now, uh, and you had the chance to do uh, what you have done the last year again, is, what would you do differently? I think the answer is kind of not a lot. We um, uh, took a very measured view. The, the upfront feasibility work that the board had done um, really has stood us in good, good stead in terms of getting to, the right, getting to the right decision. And if you remember, I, I asked, uh, the board asked kind of two questions, you know, should we do it and can we do it? And that can we do it was a very core part of the, uh, the feasibility study. You know, some would say that you know, this is the worst time to launch a clearinghouse because look at all the regulatory change. The members are completely, uh, you know, tied up with uh, changes from all the other clearing uh, houses, the CSDs, uh, the exchanges. Um, the regulatory requirements are in flux. Not quite sure where they're going to land. What the impact of the technical requirements are, uh, capital Basel, uh, Basel, Basel requirements on on clients. This really must be the worst, uh, the worst time. We kind of took a different view, which was this is the perfect time because um, all these changes um, means you don't have a legacy problem. Yeah, a lot of uh, exchanges and clearinghouses are struggling with this. How do you retrofit uh, older technology or older technology onto the new EMEA you know, segregation and portability requirements? It's a, it's kind of a tough, uh, a tough act. Plus, from a change management perspective, um, you know, members have got one thing on their mind at the moment, which is regulatory compliance and getting through the next kind of 12, uh, 12 months. So, again, it's the perfect time to be talking to members about what they want. An early thing that we did was form a uh, client advisory group with the uh, clearing members uh, for the new LME market. 
and we've received something like 80 service enhancement requests over the existing uh, service proposition. That tells me that the members are really kind of engaged and they're thinking about what uh, what has to be done. So, you know, we 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 wouldn't have uh, we wouldn't have held back. Um, you know, there's still a bit of uncertainty to be to be worked through, but we we'd much prefer to be kind of aggressive and uh, manage the uncertainty rather than kind of wait wait to see what happens. So now our joint project has been running for almost half a year, and there is a couple of months until you got the, the final um, uh, def the final delivery. Uh, from an objective uh, point of view, what's what's your uh, impression of the situation today? Um, we're we're adopting. Um Something called kind of a scrum methodology, which you may be may be familiar with. Uh, so now we talk about being with sprints, individual sprint uh, cycles. So we have six sprint cycles, which takes us through to quarter two. Uh, we've now taken delivery of four. And the last one came in last Friday, so we just started to test that. And the idea behind kind of the sprint uh, methodology really is to um, kind of iteratively develop functionality. You attack your uh, biggest problems first, get that kind of under your belt. And then as you go forward and you get familiar with the technology and you learn more from either the market or the members, you then can incorporate it into, into later sprints. So we're kind of, we're kind of halfway through and... Um, we're fairly comfortable with uh, with where we are. You know, it's a it's kind of a marriage. So we're learning uh, who leaves the seats up and who leaves the tooth, uh, you know, the toothpaste uh, cap off. But you know, we really have got to the point where I think you know, Sonoba is passionate about uh, technology. We're passionate about clearing, and really, it is a question of kind of making it making it work. And I think the key has been getting to a working relationship where when there's a problem kind of both sides are not reaching for the contract straight away. So now the question I think everybody is, is waiting for. Um, the, um, the product, as you have described it, is extremely complex. And, and not that many have succeeded doing it, at least not that fast as you're doing it. But to do it even more complex, after your appointment, after the, uh, the decision of uh, uh, who should deliver the technology, after a lot of other decisions, you were going from a member-owned club to a new owner coming from Asia, Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Can you tell us anything about that? Um. I guess a couple of things. One was, you know, through through the bid process, which happened through most of uh, 2012, there was some real um, kind of positive things which kind of came out of it. You know, we had um, four or five very competent exchange and clearing houses um, kind of running the slide rule over the books within LME, but also taking a very close look at the project. And so we found it a very useful process getting into some very detailed due diligence questions from other clearing houses. So that enabled them really to kind of kick the tires on our project. So we came out of there thinking, you know what, I think we're in the right space here. You know, and as we, as we went through the process, we just, uh, we learned from it. Um, now, one of the things about Hong Kong is that we were more than pleased when Hong Kong um, kind of won the bid. Um, there are very, very capable exchange and clearinghouse operation themselves. They're on a number of clearinghouses already, um, which enables them really to, from, from my perspective, um, give us additional assurance over the delivery capability for uh, LME Clear. Uh, functionally very, uh, very rich, uh, technically very strong, and uh, we've had nothing but, uh, but support from, uh, from them. Um, one of the consequences um, from a change management perspective was that it just created a lot of uncertainty. So while we were able to pursue the technology uh, solutions with existing LME staff and uh, we contracted a lot of people in uh, from the market, one of the things we couldn't do is actually then kind of proceed with uh, hiring permanent people once the exchange, uh, Hong Kong exchange bid uh, kind of became clear and we knew uh, what was happening, we could then proceed. So, you know, Chris Jones will be joining us as Chief Risk Officer um, in April. Adrian Farnham has already joined as the Chief uh, Operating Officer um, from 
Turquoise LSE, and he's already up and uh, up and running uh, uh, as we speak. So uh, part of the attraction for professionals coming on board for LME Clear was the fact that we had been bought by Hong Kong Exchange and the delivery capability and opportunity that they brought. So, you know, it's the usual story, kind of threats and opportunities against change. Yeah, but uh, at least we can say that it's a, it's a challenge. Yeah. Um, we at Cenobre is used to uh, always deliver in time. So we have used our 20 minutes now. But I have one, still one question for you. Okay. What's next? Oh, well, I think there's, there's two things. Short term, you know, I mentioned this is a business startup. So uh, we'll deliver the technology by summer. But then we've got the whole authorization process to go through. We've got a good dialogue running with uh, the FSA and, uh, and the bank, and uh, we're in a good good position there. So the key thing is all around getting um, platform ready. We will be platform ready for launch in 2014, early 2014. Um, we'll pick the, uh, the final launch date um, probably over the summer this year. And there's a number of kind of uncertainties which will kind of um, land the final, the final date, not least around kind of the regulatory uh, change and final EMEA timeline, but, you know, we've um, got a very good relationship with LCH, so getting to the right place in terms of uh, exit arrangements and transition arrangements from, uh, uh, from LCH is going to be important. Um, together with member readiness, you know, members have got a big book of work, so we'll work very closely with the members and take their advice on when the most appropriate time is to, uh, to deliver it. So that's the most kind of immediate uh, six to 12 months uh, view. Running along parallel on that is that, you know, we've mentioned that we've done this uh, project for strategic reason. One of that is product expansion of the current LME book. So we'll be looking to um, uh, deliver uh, products as soon as we can after, after go live. Um, some will be there for day one, some will be there for day two. So that's LME. Also with Hong Kong, we're working with Hong Kong to talk about how we deliver Asian-based functionality, be it Remimbi payments or Remimbi collateral capability, or Asian time zone capability for the new clearinghouse. Um, and again, some of that will be day one, some of that will be day two. So pretty big book of, uh, book of work, and we have a fairly disciplined change control process, which will allow us to take a kind of rational decision on what we think we can fit in before the first go live, and then what comes uh, just after. So, Trevor, thank you very much that you took your time. <laughs>